Well, good day and welcome back to part three of building the Stuart number eight mill engine. In this episode, I'm going to have a go at uh, probably the most daunting part of this whole build, which is the crankshaft. And here it is on the drawing, looking all innocent as a series of um, beautifully drawn lines. But the reality is that this part is going to be incredibly difficult to machine. The part as supplied is a forging and uh, I've already been around with a file and I've just cleaned off the forging lines or the flash line with a file just to check to see if the material is soft enough to machine and it appears to be quite good. I did my usual thing and got on YouTube and I thought well somebody's probably done this before me so I'll just see how they did it and surprisingly I could find very few references to anybody machining a forged crankshaft in this size for a, a steam engine. Most people had opted to either fabricate the crankshaft from cylindrical stock and flat stock or they had machined it from a solid piece of bar stock or flat stock. And I'll be honest with you, I machined a two-throw crankshaft for a Stuart uh, twin launch engine by making it as a built-up type of assembly. That is, I used the, you know, the bar stock and the flat stock method and I silver soldered the whole thing together and it worked fine. But just for the challenge, I'm going to try and machine this forging. So um, this could all go spectacularly wrong. Uh, the potential for it to, to go bad is quite high. So um, we could all have a good laugh here. So let's see what happens. OK, I've got the, the smaller of my two three-jaw chucks uh, mounted on the lathe. I'm going to have a go at putting the larger or the longer end of the crankshaft into the chuck first. And I'm just trying to avoid the the flash line on the forging so I don't have that against one of the jaws. I back the crank web right up against the chuck jaws just to give that a bit of support and just see how accurately that runs. That's okay. So what I'll do is I'll rough this down, get it cylindrical, I'll, I'll try machining that end or facing it and center drilling. If that's going to be problematic I'll support that with a steady rest later and I'll do that operation separately. The correct way to do this is to machine it between centers and the difficulty there is that you've got to put a fair amount of uh, end loading from the tailstock center and that's going to try to collapse the gap between the webs here. I have seen where you can uh, insert a very tiny jack in there and back that out so that you've got a, a solid line between one center and the other and then you can put a fair degree of load with your tailstock center without worrying too much about springing that closed. This is all very experimental and um, it's going to take it slowly. Things may not work out but I can back up and do things differently if that's the case. Okay, let's try getting this cleaned up just to see how it goes. Okay, surface is good, um, and we're sort of we're shooting for five sixteenths of an inch here. So I just want to see how how much over the size we are. Well, that's showing eleven millimeters, and we've got to get down to roughly uh, eight. So. But still got plenty of material to come off and there's no sign of chatter with that so that's encouraging. Um, if I can get this truly cylindrical and I can face it and send it all without doing anything else then we're, we're golden. Okay, just there's a little bit of uh, forged surface on the end there, so we're nearly there. Almost certainly that stock is bending and springing away from the tool. So if I try to machine this without any sort of tailstock support or support at this end, it's almost certainly going to become tapered, uh, which we can't afford. Uh, it's got to be perfectly cylindrical. 
So remember this is just to clean it up and I'll do the other end of the crankshaft in the same way before we try and do anything accurate. Still a bit there, but that's good enough. So I'm going to flip that round. We'll try doing the other end. All right. <coughs> I can hear a little bit of chatter occurring there now, so. That's why I don't want to go any further. I'll get the, get the fix steady on and then we're safe. Okay, so I've got my fix steady clamped down to the bed of the lathe now and I've sort of got the fingers adjusted on the cylindrical surface I've already machined. So we're going to go up and face that end, center drill, and then we'll flip it around, do the same at the other end. And then I'll feel a lot more confident if we do that. This uh, crankshaft is still oversized, so I'll come back and remachine that chamfer it later and bring it to length. But for now, that's just giving me something that's going to support that end while I finish the machining. So let's we'll flip it around to the other end. Just uh, working off camera, I swapped out my turning tool. Uh, I normally use a tangential tool holder. The only problem with it is that you don't have a lot of clearance between the back of the tool holder and the tailstock center. So I've put in a piece of high speed steel tool, I've ground that with a fair degree of nose radius as well. The drawings do call for a, I think it's like a 364th radius in the corner. And with that I can machine the face of the web and I've already started that process and I've just cleaned up the diameter of the, the crankshaft as well. So I'm just going to go nice and steady and just get this roughed out. I want all the surfaces clean. I want everything sort of to be machined and parallel or as much as I can get it. And then we'll do the super accurate work at the end. So this, uh, this setup might seem a little bit unconventional here, but the only faceplate I have for this layer is massive and it's way oversized for this job. <coughs> I don't have a catch plate and um, I spotted this set up by watching a channel called This Old Tony and uh, he's very entertaining and uh, has some really interesting ways of doing things and I had had these two lathe dogs so I figured let's give it a go. So what I'm going to do now is machine both ends of the crankshaft down to exactly nine millimeters. I have a nine millimeter reamer so I can make the blocks that go on the end of the crankshaft to do the offset center turning for the crank pin. underwire about the same amount. Really starting to doubt the accuracy of my DRA, you know. Anyway, that's fine. That'll give me about a hundredth of a millimeter clearance from the reamed hole. So it'll slide on then I'll clamp it. 
Well, you'll be happy to know that I fixed the probe for Mac 3. This probe was one that I made myself and uh, the most important thing is that the center probe be insulated from the outer shell that's clamped in the collet chuck. And to do that, I've separated the two with some polyester resin. And there's a brass shell around the outside of the probe that fits into the chuck. And uh, for whatever reason, it wasn't completely concentric. So I put it back in the four-jaw chuck, I clocked it through, machined that brass shell, and I reckon that's within a couple of hundredths of a millimeter now. So uh, the interesting thing with Mac 3 is that you can probe the center of the circle if you've got the correct screen set for doing this. So uh, what I'll do here is I'll lower the probe into this uh, bearing. Uh, that's actually the inner race of a ball bearing. So it's ground, you know, fairly accurate. Uh, so I'm going to lower that down. And then we're just going to run a script in Mac 3. And what it will do is it'll run to each of the four points on the circumference of that bearing shell. And then it just basically splits the difference. So you'll hear, hear it contact the wall. It goes back to where it was. Now it's going to probe to the right. And that'll probe. Uh, what's that? That's Y plus. And now it'll do Y minus. Okay, so that should be the center of that cylindrical hole. So I'm going to zero X and Y. I'm going to lift the probe out. And I'm going to replace that bearing center with a piece of machine bar stock. And what I'll do now is I'm going to offset the correct throw for the crankshaft and I'll put a center drill and then we'll drill down and then we'll finally ream right through. Then I'm going to part off two slices from this bar stock and that will become the ends that carry the crankshaft when we do the machining of the throw. And uh, just for fun I'll show you the, um, the probe. You can buy these. Last time I checked here in Australia it's going to cost me about $400 to get a good one. And that comes with a ruby tip and, the, and they're actually have a switch built into them. This is really just a, a contact probe. Oops. So you can see how I've attached the wire to the six millimeter tip of the probe. There's the brass shell. The interior is just uh, polyester resin. So for what I do that's adequate. Okay, according to the drawing, the throw of the crankshaft is half an inch. So all I need to do now is to drive that drill bit half an inch, either in X or Y, it doesn't matter, and then drill an accurate hole and ream that. And that's going to take the, the actual end of the crankshaft and this piece, the outer diameter, can just be chucked up in a normal way and that will carry the offset for the crank pin. So let's drive the tool bit or the drill bit. So we're going to go G. 0 x 12.7 in millimeters. Okay. Alright, we're going to follow up with an 8.9 millimeter drill bit. Okay, and we'll follow up the 9 millimeter reamer. I've only got a taper reamer, um, but it'll get started. 
and what I'm going to do then is I'm going to saw off two slices from that, get them all tidied up, and then I'll put the reamer right through when we're done. Well, you know, I said I had a 9mm reamer, I just went looking for it, and it's disappeared off the face of the earth. I don't know what's happened to it. There's actually a hole in the, the block uh, where I used to store it, and it's gone. I have got a, an adjustable reamer which should do the job, but I'm going to cut this off first separate in slices and then I'll run that adjustable reamer through until I get it right. So, uh, doesn't pay to be too confident, does it? So I've already sliced off and machined both sides of one of those discs and I center drilled the back face and I'm just about to cut off the other slice and this is a very short piece of stock and just a tip if you're trying to do this uh, when you clamp this in the vise, it's not going to grip very securely, but if you put the offcut at the other end of your vise, like that, it just sort of supports the stock and keeps the vise jaws parallel. And I want this to be about 12 millimeters. Well, the exact dimension is not that critical. That's good enough. So this is the setup that I'll be using to machine the crank pin on the crank shaft. And these are the discs that I was working on yesterday. And what I did was I put them in the CNC mill. I offset exactly half an inch and drill through that slice. Uh, and it's a, a fairly snug fit on the 9mm end of the crank shaft that I've done so far. I also milled out a, a pocket. Uh, and I set that out. So the face of the pocket is parallel to the, the center line of the disc and I also was able to line up a drill and drill down through the bore and I've tapped that M5 and I've got a, a couple of grub screws in there. These grub screws have got flat ends on them so they won't distort the shaft and the setup's going to be that I'll have one of these discs on each end of the crankshaft and I've just eyeballed this side of the, the crank web with the center line on this disc here. I don't know how critical that's going to be. Uh, I can't see a simple way of doing it. I might sort of check it with parallels and whatnot, but I've got that pretty close at the moment. And the notion is that I'm going to grip this end in the three-jaw chuck. This end will have its end supported on the center that I've already drilled and hopefully that's going to be enough to enable me to machine that web or the pin. So um, I'm going to get all this set up on the lathe and we'll have a look at it and we'll go ahead and see if we can get this machined out. And it can end up one of two ways. It's either going to be a horrible mangled mess of twisted metal and tears or we're going to get this right. And interestingly, I was just watching um, about half an hour ago uh, a YouTube uh, channel called Tinker John. And Tinker John was making the Stuart 10V vertical engine, which had almost identical forged crankshaft in it. And he told me that he was going to go ahead and, and set out and machine the crankshaft in a similar way to what I had. In fact, he had a pair of these discs already made up, and he was going about the process of putting it in the lathe. I don't know what happened, but he did something wrong, screwed it all up, and the next thing I knew, he was building a fabricated crankshaft. So, uh, you could say I was disappointed. I wanted to see how he was going to do it, but it looked like he was going to use the same method that I had. This is the setup that I'm using, and obviously one of these discs, the one close to the chuck, is fixed on the crankshaft. The other one can be rotated around the crankshaft, and it's fairly important that the two discs are aligned correctly. Now, I thought long and hard about how to do this and uh, the best I could come up with is I put a dial indicator on this disc which is just friction fit on the end of the crankshaft at this stage. The tailstock's not engaged and I'm putting the crank webs at say 12 o'clock 
and if I rotate that disc around through 180 degrees I'm just checking my dial indicator position at say 6 o'clock and 12 o'clock now remember that this end of the crankshaft isn't supported on a center at this stage and this is only a three jaw chuck so it's not going to be terribly accurate but I'm clocking zero at both uh, 12 o'clock and 6 o'clock so I figure that this disc must be aligned with that one and if I run my tailstock center in very lightly of course uh, that does move but once again if we check it at 12 o'clock and 6 o'clock it seems to be correct so it's, it's coming back to close to zero each time so um, I'm sort of satisfied that that's going to work I'm going to lock this scrub screw off here I can't put too much pressure on this uh, tail stock center because it will tend to want to push these two discs together and skew them on the crankshaft and bend the crankshaft so um, it's going to be a case of taking extremely light cuts in this uh, crank pin uh, and of course that's where it can all go wrong so uh, if we get a catch or a hang up it's going to just twist the shaft and it's good night nurse so um, let's take it nice and steady okay well I just um, ran this off camera just to avoid any sort of nasty surprises I figured if I screwed it all up I could just say guess what I decided to build a fabricated crankshaft but um, that's looking encouraging now what I've got here is I've got an inverted uh, parting tool I'm running the lathe in reverse I have honed the tip of the, the parting blade I've also ground a very shallow groove down uh, this edge of the, the parting blade here just so that it cuts on the corners and you may be able to see from the tooling mark there that it's doing that and that's really just to relieve the stress on the tool uh, try to avoid the possibility of it digging in and it looks like it's machining the outer uh, what would that be the outer circumference of the, the crank pin first which means that the, the forging is not quite accurate and which we knew um, but the side to side contact seems to be okay so that's encouraging so I'm just going to take very very light cuts very low revs um, plenty of cutting oil and we're just going to hopefully get this cleaned up to diameter That seems to be going okay. Um, I'm going to do this. I'm going to have to shift the camera. I, I can't see what I'm doing. I've got to get my head close to where I'm cutting. I don't want to run the risk of having a dig in or a catch with this. So, anyway, here comes the rain. So, what I'll do is um, I'm going to do a bit more of this. I'll give you a look and um, maybe put the camera off to the side, but you won't really be able to see what I'm doing. I'm having to do this in between rain showers but um, I've got the whole of that um, crank pin machined all the way around now it's about 1.4 millimeters oversize and I haven't yet touched the inside of the web so I'm just trying to get the crank pin down to size uh, what I'll do after that is I'll run the blade or the parting tool down the inside of each crank web just very slowly until I get them the right width apart so um, not too bad so far I'm sort of feeling confident but then I've been feeling confident before and it's all gone to the rubbish very quickly so um, I'm just going to put the camera out of the way again we'll get this really close and then we'll have a go at the crank webs well I just tried machining off the inside of those crank webs and it was a total failure the um, parting blade that I'm using has no side clearance at all so once it started uh, pushing against uh, the waist it just bent sideways uh, which made the problem worse so what I've done is I've, or I've ground up a piece of um, I think it's 5 to 16 square high speed steel and I've made a sort of a replica of the parting blade except that it now has some side clearance 
and you'll see that I've ground quite a prominent uh, hollow in the end of the blade so that it should only cut on the two points, one on the left, one on the right. So I'm going to try this, see how it goes. Okay, well that's, um, that's far more successful. Um, I'm not sure if you can see, but it's cleaned up the inside face of that crank web now and it's machining all the way to the diameter of the crank pin itself. So I'm work, working my way across the left uh, and I'll get that one, that crank web, close to its correct thickness and then I'll be able to measure the gap and do the other one. I'm just using one of these little um, small hole gauges to measure that. It's a bit awkward to get the caliper in there. So at the moment right, it's showing 9.49 and I've got to go 9.525 so I'm going to just move that across about another five hundredths that'll give me a couple of hundredths clearance <laughs> Okay, so I'm hoping Okay, it's, it's about 9.54 Maybe 9.55 so that's good enough for me. So that's that's given me a couple of hundreds clearance on that three eighth inch wide opening in the webs now. So we'll go back to machining the circumference, get that diameter in there right, and then we're back to just cleaning up the outer sections of the crankshaft, bringing them down to size. Okay, well that's done now. Finish in there isn't brilliant but it's good enough for what we're doing. Uh, it's a very low speed engine remember. Uh, I can get a piece of emery tape in there and just give that a final polish. But I'm calling that done uh, so we're going to go back now to machining uh, the shaft, the crankshaft itself between centers and trying to get that diameter correct. So um, I hope Keith appreciates the work that went into this. It was uh, quite scary and I kept expecting any minute, minute to end up with just a pile of scrap metal. Okay, well we're back to turning between centers now and uh, I'm about point, point 0.4 of a millimeter oversize. And if you're wondering what this is, that's just a 6mm bolt and nut which I've machined short enough so it'll fit in there and then I've backed it against it itself so that it clamps against the inside face of the webs. And the theory is that that makes a solid line of contact between the two centres and I can tighten the tailstock centre enough to stop any sort of uh, slop or movement. I'm just worried that without that just the slightest pressure from the tailstock is going to bend those two webs together and it'll machine true, you'll, you'll get a true shaft but as soon as you release the tailstock it'll spring apart and the two ends of the crankshaft will be angled to each other and uh, if you're wondering what that is I could lie and say that that's a feature like an oil groove but it's not it's, um, I was machining the other end of the shaft there and I wasn't concentrating, I was thinking about YouTube videos and I had my power feed set to cross feed instead of longitudinal feed and that was the result. And yes, I said some very bad words but um, I think I'm going to get away with it, it's, uh, I think it's still oversized. So I'll check this with a caliper and I'm pretty sure a 0.4 to go and I checked both ends of this and it's within say thousands of a millimetre so I'm fairly confident my tail stocks align correctly. Okay, 
Okay, I'll just uh, finish that and I reduced the thickness of that web down at 3 sixteenths of an inch. The gap between the webs is now correct, so I've just got to do the, the one remaining web and machine that side of the shaft. I've taken one of the bearing brasses off the engine and checked that and it's a little bit tight, but this will just need a light polish with some uh, fine wet and dry. So, um, so far I'm happy. Um, well, I won't show you the other half of this because it's just the same. But nearly got a finished crankshaft. Okay, well there's the, the finished crankshaft in position in its bearings. I've fitted the oil cup, so I've tightened down the studs and the nuts. I made a replacement stud for the one that was missing in the kit. And curiously, the flywheel grub screw, which you can't see here, but uh, it was supplied as a 6BA grub screw and on the drawings it showed to drill and tap at 5BA so I had to make a, a grub screw for that as well. I decided against machining the sides of the crank webs mainly because you can still see the forging marks and I wanted to be able to show off a bit and say that I did machine this crankshaft from a forging and I didn't fabricate it. So uh, all I did there was I cleaned those up with a scotch bright wheel this uh, end face here, I couldn't think uh, of an easy way of machining that, uh, so I just uh, ground that on the linishing belt and uh, it came up quite nicely. Um, I'm really happy with the way this has turned out. The fit is something on the firm side at this stage, but uh, that'll loosen up as the engine runs a bit. I can also uh, just machine the tiny bit off the inside uh, of the, the bearing brass, let's just give it a little bit of uh, lateral clearance. So uh, the flywheel that you can see here, um, I was going to do this in this episode of the build but I don't think it's going to fit so it's going to appear in the next episode. So uh, for now I think uh, I'm happy with that, that's, that's turned out way better than I thought and there were so many places where it could have gone wrong. So that's it for now and thanks for watching.